Good morning. My name is Andy Marks. I'm chairman of the Department of Physiology and Cellular Biophysics at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. And I'm delighted to be here this morning for a conversation with Dr. Roy Vagelos, retired chairman and CEO of Merck and Company, Inc. Good morning, Roy. Hi, Andy. How are you? Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions, and this is very uh, informal, uh, and uh, we'll uh, go from there. Unfortunately, the first question has three parts, so please feel free to ask me to repeat any of the parts as we go through it. Like so many in your generation, Roy, of highly accomplished scientists, you grew up in a poor immigrant family with no role models as scientists. How did this affect your drive to succeed, and what drew you into an academic career, which was so foreign to the culture of your nuclear family? And ultimately, how do you think your family of origin influenced the scientific questions that you chose to pursue? That's a complicated yes, question, but I'll take it one at a time. First, my family um, were I immigrants. Uh, both my mom and dad were, were born uh, as Greeks, but, but were born in, in Turkey. Okay. Uh, my grandfather on my father's side was a physician, and it's quite amazing that he was, he was uh, uh, born on the island of Lesbos, and Lesbos is, is uh, very close to Turkey, and so his children were born in Turkey. My grandfather was trained at the University of Athens as a physician and, and practiced medicine during his early life, but he died very young. Uh, when he died, he left a rather large family, five children, four boys and a girl, and, and they slowly, the boys, uh, one after another immigrated to the U.S. None had been, had been educated at the time that he had died at, to, an, to a higher degree. And so when they arrived in the U.S., started, starting with the oldest of the brothers, he did what all good Greek immigrant families did. He started a small restaurant mm -hmm. and little luncheonette in Westfield, New Jersey. And then, and then the, the, uh, all the other brothers subsequently followed and, and came and, and set up with him initially, and then different little small luncheonettes uh, around Westfield, uh, Woodbridge, uh, Rahway, uh, eventually, and started these small businesses, then went back, each of them, for an arranged marriage. And my dad went back and married my mother, and, and, and therefore our family was all uh, brought up in the U.S. My sisters, my two sisters and I, were born in the U.S. Uh, we were uh, born in a family that had known uh, a father with, who, were, who was highly educated, but who were not themselves educated. And so they had the notion that education was very important. And the last thing they wanted was for me to end up uh, running the restaurant. But that's not to say that I was shielded from it because it was a family restaurant. So my sisters and I uh, always worked with my parents in our restaurant. And, and my dad, among the brothers, was the person who made things. He, he made ice cream and candies and, and supplied the other brothers in their other stores. And so uh, he was a doer, and, but, but, but someone with very high spirit and someone who, who felt that education was primary and, and that you would succeed if you got into college. And so I heard that from early days. And of course, I, I worked pretty hard. I started as a very poor stu student. When I was young, I uh, was not at all serious. And, and uh, somehow got the notion through repeated discussions at home that, that going to college was important and getting a scholarship was important. And so uh, once I got to, to uh, high school, uh, which was in Rahway, New Jersey, uh, I really turned it on and, and worked hard, which was different from my earlier years, and, and was quite successful. Uh, in our luncheonette, our major customers were people who worked at Merck. So I was early in contact with people who were chemists, microbiologists, and engineers. And that's what I, that's what I heard as, as I was doing the usual uh, waiting on tables and cleaning up and sweeping the floors. Uh, so I was in contact with these people almost continuously. And so 
my early ideas as uh, I went through high school was to be like them because not only were they tremendously interested in their work, but they were very happy people and I liked their lifestyle and I wanted to be like that. And so as I finished high school, uh, I th my choices were few. I didn't know much about universities and, and there was much less known about other universities to, in a small high school. And so I applied to three places, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins, by chance, and, and, uh, and uh, Rutgers. And I was not accepted at Johns Hopkins, which was interesting because I was not accepted at, during an interview in which they asked me whether my parents had, had attended Johns Hopkins, and I said no. They said, well, where did they go to college? And I said, well, they didn't go to college. And they said, do you have any questions? <laughs> and so I, that was the end of my interview. But I was accepted at Penn and, and at Rutgers. I went to Penn on scholarship and, and uh, immediately got involved in chemistry because I wanted to be like the Merck chemists. And, and uh, <clears throat> that really caught on with me. I, I, I loved it. Uh, I took all the chemistry courses that were available and, and in fact I took a course that was taught for the first time, an advanced course in mechanisms of uh, rea organic reactions uh, taught by a man by the name of Alan Day and, and um, I loved that. And so I was heading into a career of chemistry or possibly to be like my granddad, uh, a physician. At the last minute actually at the uh, I, w I was to graduate in three years, as it turned out, because I took so many cl courses so quickly. And, and so at the end of my second year, I was faced with a decision of, of uh, graduate school or medicine. And, and a lot of the bright kids at Penn at that time were going into medicine. That influenced me. And, and my grandfather, of course, the story of his life influenced me as well. I applied to, to medical school and, and went to Columbia uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, where I uh, initially had a very tough time because I have a terrible memory. And, and, uh, and anatomy almost wiped me out because that was all memory. And, and uh, fortunately, there was also biochemistry in the first year and, and a few other things that I could do. And, and so I survived the first year and, and, then, and, and then had the notion that I could use my knowledge of chemistry to, uh, to apply to medicine. From, from, from early on, my ideas were, you know, how do you understand a, a disease or how do you understand the mechanism of action of a drug? Uh, and, and so I went through at that rate, at the end of uh, Columbia Medical School, um, I went to the Mass General Hospital, where, where of course I was very turned on. I went in. I was in internal medicine. I loved it, and I wanted to be a, a practicing doctor. That's what I wanted to be at the end of two years. But it was at the time of the um, doctor draft was still ongoing. Um, this was 1954, and I owed Uncle Sam two years of service time, and so our. Uh, I, I actually uh, signed up for the Army, uh, but uh, the head nurse on one of my services had a boyfriend at NIH, and she said, you ought to go and visit NIH. Uh, the, the person who, who was already there was, was uh, Dan Fetterman, mm -hmm. and, and his wife was the head nurse. Uh, his future wife was the head nurse. And so I, I agreed to go to NIH, and, and I flew from Boston. That was the first time I'd been in a plane. It cost $25, and I took insurance. I was so worried about it because I'd already been married. And, uh, and, and uh, I, I should mention that, that I did get married between my internship and assistant residency, so after one year. And I married a woman who, had, who was just graduating from Barnard College and whom I had met while I was a medical student. So we had already been seeing each other for three years, four years before we got married. And, and uh, anyway, we, uh, 
I visited the NIH, met Earl Statman, and that was a changing point in my life because Earl was a young guy. He was 10 years older than I. Uh, I was at that time 26 or 27, so he was about 37. And, and he was one of the top biochemists at, at NIH. He was in the National Heart Institute. Uh, well, that meeting him was, was a real experience because he was so excited about what he was doing, uh, but he spoke very softly. Uh, and so he told me about what he was, his, he was involved in, in uh, uh, microbial fermentations and understanding how fatty acids were broken down. And, and he, he talked about esters of coenzyme A. And coenzyme A, of course, had barely been discovered when I was in medical school. And so the fact that he was working with acetyl-CoA at that time was to me startling. And he told me about the reactions that, that the coenzyme A esters were involved in. And he was so excited that by the time I left, I was also excited, although I, I didn't follow much of what he said. All, I, all was transmitted to me was this intense, this intensity of, of interest and excitement uh, based on his own research. And so I asked to work in his lab, and he agreed. Uh, it was an uh, uh, interesting relationship because he was a PhD, had never worked with an MD, and was very suspicious mm -hmm. that, that uh, why would an MD be interested in this kind of work? And so every few weeks he would ask me whether, he, whether I thought I'd made a mistake. And I wondered whether he was trying to give me a message. Uh, but, I, but we worked together, and by the time, by the end of our, and, and by the way, I, I, um, the clinical work that I was assigned was something that I had already been thinking about, and that was cardiology. I was in the National Heart Institute. All my patients were heart patients. So the deal was that I would spend half my time taking care of patients and the other half doing research. And by the end of two years, I had been called by uh, Walter Bauer at the Mass General and offered a position, very junior, uh, to return uh, on the junior faculty. Um, and so I went to Earl and said, Earl, you know, uh, I, I think it's time for me to go back. And he said, why would you do that? I said, well, because I'm very good at clinical work and, and I've been offered a position back at the Mass General, which is where I started. And he said, but you know, you can be a good, even better biochemist. And he had never said that to yeah. me. You know, this was a sort of revelation. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you'll stay, I'll give you new space and, and, uh, and, and you can build your, you know, start your independent career. Uh, I didn't quite know what that meant other than the fact that we were just finishing some papers together. And, and uh, what it meant was from then on, instead of discussing everything, which we did otherwise, we didn't discuss anything. He sort of walked away and left me uh, on my own, but also uh, had given me a technician uh, and, uh, and a position where I could uh, re recruit someone who, who wanted to come to the lab. Uh, soon thereafter, Al Alberts, who had been a graduate student at the University of Maryland uh, and hadn't finished his degree, but was, needed a job, came to work with Earl Statman. And Earl said, I'll give you a job, but you'll work with Roy. Mm -hmm. And so Al Alberts and I started working together. That was about 1958 yeah. and, or 59. And so that started uh, our collaboration. And we started working on fatty acid metabolism. And ultimately, we got into the uh, biosynthesis of fatty acids which became then our, my major work for the next right. 10 years. And, and, uh, that, and then I worked very closely with Al. Uh, Al was my assistant initially, but quickly became a colleague because he was uh, very smart and, and very capable in the lab. And so we worked together and worked on the, uh, the synthesis of fatty acids. Uh, soon thereafter, we were joined by Phil Majerus, and Phil got into it also, and, and uh, we came up with the discovery of acyl carrier protein, which was sort of the, 
the central uh, carrier of all the metabolites during fatty acid biosynthesis. And we discovered that and almost simultaneously Sally Wakil's laboratory at Duke. So we were competing for those. It was interesting, the competitors at that time were, uh, in addition to Sally Wakil, were, were Theodor, Theodor Lenin in Munich and Conrad Bloch mm -hmm. at Harvard. Pretty heavy hitters. Heavy hitters and, and, and uh, a group that, that we had fun competing with because it was friendly competition. And, and, and uh, so instead of staying at NIH for, for uh, two years, which was the original plan, I stayed for 10 and, and started a family, of course, and, and, and we had a very productive time, at the end of which uh, I was called and offered a position at Washington University in St. Louis, right. which I had never visited. And so it was, uh, it was a, it was an interesting change. Was Phil Majerus already there? At that time? No, we moved together. Okay. He was a postdoc with me. Okay. And, and the idea was that he had originated, Phil had started at Washington University at medical school and was, of course, the top student in his class. And, and uh, then he worked with me as a postdoc for several years, and then when then when he he and I moved simultaneously, uh, he moved to the Department of Medicine with a joint appointment in biochemistry, and I moved as head of biochemistry, succeeding Carl Corey, and and so we picked up the family, we moved to St. Louis, and and uh, and then I was now back at a medical school, uh, teaching medical students, graduate students and, and uh, continuing my research. So the, the research was going great. Uh, we continued research in fatty acid metabolism, then branched out into, into complex lipids and ultimately cholesterol. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so all of that knit together to build a, a career that was all science. Uh, it was getting back towards medicine when we came back to medical school which was something I didn't think a lot about when I was at NIH. But when I was at the medical school, I started relating more of our work towards what was happening in medicine. So did you continue seeing patients at, in WashU? Uh, no, uh, the, the patient work really covered only about five years at, at the National Heart Institute, because after my two years, then I could see them as, as often as I wanted, and so I, uh, slowly uh, geared down my clinical work over about a five-year period. So at the end of that period, I was doing pure basic research. And, and, uh, and that, that was sort of giving me a message, and that is you tend to do things that you're most interested in and that come most easily to you. And, and research just sucked me in. And, and uh, I had terrific feedback from, from the work that was going on at the time. And so as far, as far as I was concerned, and at the time I moved to Washington, Washington University, uh, I was a biochemist. And, and uh, teaching medical students was as close as I was going to be to medicine. But it was closer than I had been uh, at, at the end of my time at NIH. I was a researcher and a teacher at that time. We'll get to some more of the science and then yeah. the rest of your career in a moment. But I did have uh, another question that's sort of philosophical in yeah. nature. Yeah. Um, so you have identified music, violin, and singing as something that you love and it's been a part of your life from very early on, even before uh, the science. And we've heard how you got sucked into the science and the influence of your grandfather in your decision to go into medicine. But can you talk about uh, the role of uh, music in your life and what parallels, if any, you see between music and science? Yeah, well, I think the music to me has always been something I have loved. I started playing a violin, I think, when I was in the first grade. And so, and I played it right through high school. Then when I went to the university, I rode, on, I forgot to mention that, I rode on the lightweight crew, which sort of, which really uh, was hard on the hands. Mm -hmm. For you, you, you cannot do that with calloused okay. hands and fingers and play a violin. So I did not play that much while I was at 
the university. Um, by the way, the only thing that I did seriously other than chemistry was row on the crew, on the lightweight crew, which was kind of fun because it, that also modified my life. Um, but the... Uh, Can you but, tell, what do you mean by modified your life? Well, I, I, I mean, it sort of got me in, into the idea that uh, uh, part of each day uh, should be dedicated to doing something that's athletic. Mm -hmm. And that's something I picked up then and have never quit. And, and so, th so that allows me to n not get, get obese or anything like that because I eat a lot. And, and, uh, so. so today it's tennis. That so I, yeah, tennis and, and I, I work out. I have, uh, I have a, uh, an, an elliptical runner mm -hmm. and, and a Concept 2 rower, which I do almost every day. Right. And so that's the way I control my weight. Yeah. And, uh, keep sort of limbered up. But to uh, the, the music side has always been something that I've gone back to. So I went back to music after, when I was on the house staff at the Mass General Hospital. We had a quartet. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and, and later on, uh, whenever I have had time, uh, you know, some period of time, I've gone back because I love music. Now it's mostly passive. I love all the performing music uh, things that go on around the city where we live. And, and uh, so we love the Metropolitan Opera. We love the symphony orchestras. We have been involved in the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. So music is, yeah. is something that requires uh, dedication, uh, practice, and, and, uh, and focus. And those are the things that really relate to science as well. Yeah, it seems so many scientists are either mu musicians themselves or music lovers, and there must be some connection in the brain, I would imagine. I, th I think there is. I think, uh, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's certainly something we all love. Getting back to your clinical period of your career earlier on, uh, in, uh, in you, you write about uh, a Munchausen patient that you saw in the, earlier in your career and it seemed to make a lasting impression. And is that, is that true or did I get that wrong? And if so, what lessons were learned? And maybe you can describe what the patient had yeah. just uh, because many of the listeners may not know what Munchausen. Yeah. Uh, Munchausen syndrome is a condition that people take who fake a, uh, a clinical syndrome, a clinical disease. And, and while, while I was uh, a young clinician at the National Heart Institute, a patient was, was uh, admitted who, who was said to have a heart problem that, that, was, causing, uh, that was causing him to have uh, uh, seizures. And so he was admitted over a weekend, and I, had, I came in after the weekend on Monday, and suddenly was, I was the doctor for this person who was having seizures. and, and uh, and so I examined him, <clears throat> could find nothing wrong with his heart. And, and so I uh, had some skull films done and the usual uh, cursory uh, neurological examination where I found nothing. Uh, but I was not sure and so I invited the uh, head of the neuro neurology uh, clinical group to come and to examine him as a consultant. And the person came and he said, well, he had clearly I had missed a lesion in the, in the brain because I did not interpret the skull films properly. Well, I could not believe that because I couldn't, when he pointed out what he was, point, what he was talking about, I couldn't see what he was talking about. And so, uh, nevertheless, he walked away and told me I had, I mean, he had flubbed it. And, uh, uh, but I, I could not believe what this man was saying because I could not see a deficient, any, any kind of a defect in the, in the skull x-ray. Uh, when he left, I watched the patient continue to watch him, and I realized uh, that by, by observation that he was ha calling for pain and having a seizure and then, and then would call for medication, and the medication was always morphine. And so after watching a pattern of this, I realized that this guy uh, was faking. And so I called the, the uh, city hospital and described the patient. And they said, oh, so-and-so is up at your place now. And so he was a Munchausen. Yeah. He was faking the whole thing. And, and, uh, 
the what impact that had on me was the fact that the senior neurologist of the of the Neurology Institute at that time was so dogmatic and was not willing to take the take the uh, opinion of a junior person and just put that person down. Uh, that was me. And, and so I never got over that. And I have always been very careful to, to listen to anyone uh, at any level because people have good ideas and, and, uh, and have opinions that are very valuable. And so I've been pretty darn sensitive to that. An important lesson. I was laughing because I had a very similar experience during my training with a Munchausen patient. Um, you mentioned Earl Statman uh, and how uh, he influenced you. What would you say was the most important thing that you learned from him? Earl, Earl had, uh, first of all, he was incredibly smart and, and was, uh, was wonderful in dealing with young people. And in fact, uh, you may know that, that Mike Brown was trained in his laboratory, right. went on to get a Nobel Prize. Stanley Prusner was trained by Earl Stapman. So Earl had a whole number of people who went through the lab, of course, long after I did, because I'm much older than they are. But, but the beauty of, of Earl was that he would start you on a project and, and then <clears throat> allow you to become independent as soon as he thought you were capable. So there was never any feeling that you were being controlled or slowed because of, of Earl's involvement. And, and uh, after the two, first two years that I worked with him, all the work that I did from then on, which clearly derived from some of his early ideas, he never put his name on any of those publications. And, 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 but, and, and he was loyal to me throughout my career. And, and I would say, if you were to talk with Mike Brown or Stanley Prusner or all these people, they will tell you about how supportive, how loyal, and how quickly he would release people from any kind of uh, yeah. commitment to him. And so he was, he was a wonderful developer of young people and people love this guy. I mean, he was, he was the best. So just from looking at you, it's obvious you're in great shape uh, for a person of any age. And yet you uh, talk about being obsessed with fat. And you studied fatty acid metabolism. And very early on in your research, you were already thinking about making new drugs. And in this case, targeting fatty acid metabolism. Where did that interest come from? And, and how do you explain that obsession with fat? Well, the, the, uh, the uh, ideas about fat, of course, came from our research in fatty acid biosynthesis. And, and, uh, and uh, the idea of working on drugs really was very peripheral and, and never serious uh, while I was doing the basic research, either at NIH or at Washington University. And in fact, uh, after I had been at Washington University for nine years, uh, one thing happened that was <clears throat> very important in my career, <clears throat> and that is I was called by the University of, Calif University of Chicago, uh, and then later by the University of Pennsylvania, and in each instance told that I was a top choice of the committee to become dean. And, and, and that was, to me, a very troublesome call because I never pictured myself as a dean. I thought I was a researcher and someone who was going to do research my entire career. <clears throat> and I did not think deans did research. Mm -hmm. In fact, the deans that I saw did anything but research. And, and so that was a rather depressing thought that people who were observing me would think of me as a dean. <clears throat> not long after that, I was called by a friend at Merck, uh, a friend because I had worked one summer in a Merck research laboratory between my first and second year uh, of medical school. <clears throat> so I knew a few people there. And I was called by this person who had by that time become a vice president in research. And I was asked whether I would consider becoming head of the Merck research laboratories. 
And I said, no, I had no interest. I hadn't thought about drug discovery. He said, why don't you come and visit? So I agreed to visit the Merck Research Labs. Uh, got to visit my parents who lived in Rahway at the time. And, and uh, what I saw was that pharmaceutical research for drug discovery was based on pharmacology, live animal research, uh, where animals were given syndromes or conditions that were akin to human disease, high blood pressure, heart failure, infections, etc., and, and, uh, and uh, very little biochemistry was being used as, as the basis for drug discovery. Um, I went away from that uh, original visit thinking that, that that was odd that they weren't doing it, and, and could it, was it, would it be possible to really get into serious drug discovery by understanding mechanism of actions of drugs and targeting on single molecules. And the more I thought about it and, 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 and contrasting with the idea of becoming a dean, I thought going to a place where I would be responsible for basic research, drug discovery, would take advantage of, of my background mm -hmm. and, and something that I wanted to do. And that is it also would put me in a position of doing something uh, closer to clinical medicine because I would be impact, potentially impacting health of people. And so I then really thought about it, uh, the transition and, and uh, decided it was worth a risk on my part. It was a huge risk on the part of the people at Henry Gadsden, who was CEO of, of Merck at that time. Uh, offered me the job, and, and I said, you know, uh, Henry, if I were to take this job, I would completely change the, the uh, approach to drug discovery, and uh, would that be okay with you? And he said, uh, uh, if we did not want a major change, we wouldn't be talking with you. I then said, uh, what would happen if, if the business really got weak? Mm -hmm. And, and, and sales were not going well. I didn't know what I was talking about, of course, sales. Uh, he said, if things were, went poorly, he said, we would cut back on all parts of the company. We'd cut back on marketing and selling. Uh, we'd cut back on the, on the corporate groups. But he said, the last thing we would ever do is cut back on research, because that's the future of this company. And on that basis, uh, I thought another month and then accepted the job. Uh, with, with uh, another major transition of family. Sure. So we left St. Louis and moved to New Jersey. You talked about <clears throat> the time that you were in medical school and obviously through the early part of your career seeing patients. Uh, you are a physician and then you became a scientist and then went to uh, eventually head up Merck. Can you talk a little bit about that transition from earlier in your career mm -hmm. where you clearly saw yourself as one kind of a person and then became something uh, quite different and any uh, words of advice for other people coming along that pathway? Yeah. Well, the transition from, from uh, and I, first of all, going, I, I see it as a sort of a continuum. Yeah. I left the Mass General Hospital as, as you know, yeah. the people leaving there think they're the best practitioners of clinical medicine possible and I loved it. Uh, by the time I left the National Heart Institute, uh, I realized that I had strengths in biochemistry, and I wanted to, to do that. But uh, the deeper I got into biochemistry, it was pure basic research. Sure. The further I got from clinical work, and, and then the transition to Washington University was a transition back towards medicine, because I was going to teach medical students. And, and uh, so that was getting back to my original goal of being a doctor. Uh, uh, when, I went, when I then transitioned to Merck, this was an opportunity to really close the circle. If we were able to discover drugs that were important for human health, we could impact lives of millions of patients. But do you think without an MD you would have been able to make those connections between your basic research and the needs of patients? Uh, that's an interesting question, and that is, 
without the basis in medicine, mm -hmm. would that transition have been, uh, as, as I would say, the transition to Merck and medicine was far easier mm -hmm. for me because of my background sure. in medicine. There's no question about mm -hmm. that. And I worry about people who take on jobs heading organizations with no background at all because just understanding disease yeah. as far as it was understood and understanding the impact of other medicines, you could imme immediately start thinking, making connections of what you know in science and how they could do to impact a disease or improve a drug class where you could see where you could sure. make improvements. Turn the clock back to uh, a very um, <clears throat> exciting time in your career uh, before Merck. Uh, and what was the central problem that you were trying to solve vis-a-vis -vis acetyl-CoA and the enzymes controlling fatty acid synthesis? Try to put us yeah. back in that time and uh, what the challenges were scientifically and how, how you approach them. Yeah, well, the knowledge, of course, of uh, fatty acid metabolism, which started with uh, uh, actually H.A. Barker mm -hmm. at, at, at Berkeley, who was the teacher of Earl Statman, and then Earl Statman was carrying on looking at, at uh, fatty acid metabolism and how it was broken down, and, and beta oxidation had been discovered along the way. Coenzyme A had been discovered by, by um, uh, Lippmann, Fritz Lippmann, the structure of acetyl-CoA was discovered by, that is an activated mm -hmm. uh, acetate, was discovered by uh, Theodore Linden in, in, uh, in Munich at the Max Planck Institute. So when I got into it, that was hot stuff. Mm -hmm. That was as hot as you can get in, in an era. And so I fell right into the middle of it because of my association with Earl Statman. What was, what was then being discussed was that was that beta oxidation was the way lipids, fatty acids, were broken down, and fatty acid biosynthesis was just the, the reverse of that. And that was the general understanding of everyone. And so our entry into the field was the discovery of, oh, by the way, my, my ability to get into that field was very much based on my ability in chemistry, mm -hmm. because all the intermediates of fatty acid metabolism were thioesters, and they're very hard to make. And with a, with a, a chemistry background, I was making things that other people could not make. And so I could move much more rapidly. But the whole thing boiled down to what happens to acetyl-CoA between a two carbon and a 16 or 18 carbon chain. And, and was it just a reversal of beta oxidation? And we discovered uh, malonyl coenzyme A as a metabolite early on, unrelated to fatty acid biosynthesis. But we found this uh, three carbon activated group. And when we put that together with acetyl CoA in a microbial enzyme system that, that we made, uh, we were whipping out fatty acids. So we suddenly had a new intermediate in, in what appeared to be the pathway between acetyl-CoA and the long-chain fatty acid. And so that was exciting. Uh, then, we, then we discovered that there was, for this, for this series of enzymes to do anything, we needed a, a, a heat-stable factor, which turned out to be pr a protein, which ultimately was, was characterized as the, the acyl carrier protein. Which was, which was an amazing thing at the time and, and uh, was the key to understanding fatty acid biosynthesis. And, and, and so that was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we discovered it and, and uh, um, Sally Wakil at Duke came up with it independently, and, and, uh, but we were ahead. <laughs> and, and so we sort of won the race and, and, and uh, it was just a very exciting thing to be able to under, understand how you could build this uh, 16 or 18 carbon chain and do it rapidly and efficiently at room temperature and, and to characterize all those enzymes. So that was, that was uh, heaven from the point of view of an enzymologist. And of course, uh, understanding these, uh, the enzymes and all these reactions was what 
drug discovery for me ultimately was all about. Can you describe the importance of Jacques Minot and Francois Jacob in your science? Yeah, so, so uh, as, as was sort of habit at the National Institutes of Health, seventh year on the job meant that if you wished, you could have a sabbatical. And I heard uh, 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 the scientists, uh, Jacques Monod and Jacob, talk in New York City. And specifically, uh, Jacques Monod gave a lecture which was electrifying. And he was talking at that time about allosteri and, and also uh, messenger RNA. And that was just the beginning. That was about 1962. Right. And, and uh, so I ax asked to work in his lab, and I went to work with Jacques and was exposed to an entirely different kind of guy mm -hmm. other than Earl Statman. Uh, Jacques Monod was someone who had a tremendous imagination. And, and it was so imaginative that many people thought he moved too fast mm -hmm. and that he moved without a, enough facts. But in fact, most of the stuff that he, that he really uh, uh, explained turned out to be fact in the end. So the messenger RNA work worked out, uh, uh, turned out to be true and accurate, and Alice theory became accepted by everybody. And so he was, he was just terrific. So I worked a year in the laboratory and largely picked up uh, microbial mutants as, as tools of, of the work that I was going to do back in the U.S. So I, while I worked on, I looked for a suppressor mutation. I never found one, but that was part of the work I did. Then I did some allosteri uh, uh, enzy enzymology, which helped him in his work. And so we became fast friends, and, and uh, he tried to convince us to stay in, in, in Paris, but, but uh, I was drawn back to, uh, to the work I was doing in the U.S. Can you talk about your move to head research at Merck from the perspective of its impact on your science? Well, that, that's interesting. The, uh, when we moved to Merck, uh, I initially moved with a very small group from Washington University. Al Alberts, who had been with me from NIH, then came to Washington U. Did he eventually get his doctorate? He, he never did. Never did. So, so Al never finished his doctorate, which was, which was uh, something I pushed very hard. In fact, at one time, I told him he had to take off mm -hmm. uh, for summer and could not come back to work until he finished his degree, which he, he did not finish. So, but I needed him, and he wanted to come back. So we worked together. And, uh, uh, when, and I was to move to, to uh, Merck. Al had by then gone up the faculty ladder and was an associate professor with tenure at Washington University based on his accomplishments. And, and the faculty were the ones who wanted to have him promoted. I was, and, and so I obviously didn't hold him back. But when I was to move to Merck, I told Al that I, would, I was going to leave, and that was a risky thing. <clears throat> uh, and that he should remain where he had tenure and where he had done so well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, uh, he, no, he said, no, he would, we'd been working together so many years by that time that he would like to come. And so, so he came with a small number of postdocs. My initial idea was that we would slowly uh, learn about drug discovery and, and then get into discovery ourselves, but I would retain a research group myself. <clears throat> and for the first year, I did retain this, but during that year, I recognized that the research group that I was now in charge of was large, so much bigger than I was used to, that it was taking all my efforts to understand what they were doing and try to reorganize the research to bring in the biochemical approach that I had planned to do. So that by the end of the year, I had arranged for all my postdocs to take jobs, and they all got excellent jobs. Uh, and and uh, but Al, of course, stayed. And, and so we quickly adopted what was going on at Merck as our entire work. And two things happened. One was that I felt it was my responsibility that everybody succeed. 
And so I spent time with every research group and, and where I thought their research was not very productive, I waited until I had an idea of something that they could do that involved their expertise, uh, but swung towards biochemistry to get them onto a new project. The other thing I realized was that I could not continue being a primary researcher. I could not do that as well as oversee the large number of projects that I had to be involved in. And so I decided early that I was going to be an advisor, uh, someone who would give ideas, but I set the pattern very early and then I never put my name on the paper. And so no paper that was ever published from Merck, and of course there were thousands over the 19 and a half years I was there, had my name on it. And, and I made that decision so that people would feel free to talk with me and, and, and not feel that they would lose leadership of a project. I wanted them to feel ownership, but I would stew and worry and think and call them at night uh, if I had an idea on their project. So I felt very much part of every project that went on at Merck, every research area. And so it was a tremendously steep learning curve for me as I learned about all different areas of research, including vaccines. And we had experts uh, in different kinds of research all over the place. And I wanted to be able to help them and, and to succeed. And, and, uh, and we did. Can you tell us about the development of the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor at Merck, uh, your role in this project, and in particular comments on, comment on the highs and lows of this project? Yeah, well, well the, of course, the HMG-CoA reductase project was one that was very dear to me because uh, early on when, when Al and I moved to Merck, uh, we looked around to see what really might be a, a project for drug discovery. Uh, we knew about the cholesterol hypothesis, and that was, of course, based on several things. Uh, the fact that people who died of coronary heart disease, heart attacks, uh, their arteries were filled with cholesterol. The, uh, the animal models of, of uh, hypercholesterolemia and causing coronary heart disease. Uh, the epidemiology around the world where people, Japanese with very low blood cholesterol, almost never died of heart attacks. People in Finland who uh, uh, had an incidence of death from heart attack that was 14 times higher than the Japanese uh, had extremely high, sky high blood cholesterol. So all that information was available and the biosynthetic sequence 24 sequential enzymes for biosynthesis of, of uh, cholesterol was just had been unraveled by largely uh, Lenin and Bloch, uh, Lenin in Munich and Bloch at Harvard, uh, for which they got the Nobel Prize. Uh, Lenin's laboratory also uh, indicated the, the rate limiting enzyme is uh, HMG CoA reductase. And so that information was stuff that I, that I knew that I thought we could apply, but so did everybody else. It came at a time when it was an obvious target for drug discovery. Uh, and the, and the, uh, uh, that was really brought to a head by the uh, Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein experiments which also indicated that HMG-CoA reductase was a choke point in the biosynthesis and a regulatory enzyme, and the initial discovery of the first statin by Endo in Japan. Now that was a startling uh, discovery, and that is he found a metabolite uh, from a, micro, a microbial uh, fermentation, uh, which, was, which was called compactin. Uh, another name was mevastatin, uh, which was the first inhibitor of the HMG-CoA reductase. 
Now, as I say, many organizations had focused on that enzyme, uh, including Merck, uh, but the discovery was the first statin was made in Japan. Uh, so that, of course, focused us even more that we had to get going. We needed to find, to see if there was something that we could find. And, and Al's group uh, quickly came up with lovastatin, which was, again, a fermentation product uh, a natural product which was isolated. It was structurally related but different from, from mevastatin which came from, from Japan. It was very clear that we were behind in the, in the, in the race, but we were number two. And, and so we were racing along, did all the animal studies to support uh, the clinical studies, and, and then lovastatin <coughs> went into the clinic. <coughs> it was well behind uh, the Japanese group, which was probably months ahead of us, uh, when we heard that all the clinical studies in Japan had been stopped. Uh, and and uh, it was a shock because it was an open competition. Uh, I immediately got on the phone and talked with people at Sankyo Company, Japanese company, where it was being developed, and, and asked them to tell us, to explain to me exactly what was found. Uh, my concern was that it was an enigma, really. Was it possible that uh, all inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase uh, would be a problem? And the problem w they would not give any information on, but the rumor was that compactin or mevastatin was causing tumors in animals. So the enigma was do all inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase cause tumors in animals, if that's what is being seen? Uh, or is it possible that our, ma our lovastatin, although it's related to their compound, uh, would not cause a problem? We couldn't tell that. They, would they said it was an industrial secret. It would give us no information. And so we stopped immediately. That day, we stopped all clinical studies with the uh, notion that if there was a problem, we could not put at risk sure. any patients. And so lovastatin was stopped in the clinic for two years mm -hmm. while we did long-term, finished all our long-term animal cancer studies, carcinogenicity studies. And, and also, during that period, the chemists, of course, were hard at work trying to modify, uh, come up with another uh, structure that would be uh, chemically different enough to possibly not have the problem of lovastatin, if lovastatin had the problem, and, and uh, also maybe be superior in some other aspect. They came up with uh, simvastatin. And, and, uh, and so that was exciting because it was more potent, longer duration of action, and it was different in structure. Well, at the end of two years, uh, physicians, largely in, in both the East Coast and West Coast, came to Merck and said, look, we've got patients with hypercholesterolemia who are going to die unless there's some way to reduce that cholesterol. And so the FDA agreed that we should go back with lovastatin, uh, and, but go back in high-risk patients. So we went back into the clinic after having been out for two years and, and started experiments in patients who already had coronary heart disease and high blood cholesterol. And what we found, of course, was a very safe, oh, I should say that all the studies were clean at Merck. So it was time to go back. <clears throat> and we went back with lovastatin. We found that we reduced total cholesterol, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, and, and uh, safely. And so the drug was approved. The first statin in the world was approved in 1987. Uh, the project started in 75, 1987, 12 years, which is about average. And, and uh, so that was the first statin. Some physicians thought it was a good idea and, and, and we're going to use it to lower blood cholesterol. Uh, others said, well, you're lowering blood cholesterol, so what? And, and, uh, and so that was an issue, and, and, and we, were going to, we needed to have an outcome study. Now, this was new in those days. 
Uh, this is the late 1980s, and, and so we started what was called the simvastatin. We, we, instead of using lovastatin, we went to what we thought was a slightly better drug, simvastatin. We did the simvastatin sur uh, Scandinavian survival study, the 4S study, which gathered some fame because it, it, it was based on the study of 4,400 patients who had coronary heart disease, high blood cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, and half of them were put on uh, simvastatin and the other half were put on a placebo for five and a half years. As this was double blind. At the end of that time, they broke the blind, and it was an amazing, just an amazing uh, result, and that is a reduction in death from any cause of 30 percent, a reduction in death from, this is comparing the drug versus the placebo, reduction in death, uh, incidence of death from heart attack, 43 uh, percent, reduction in strokes of 30 percent. And so that essentially one experiment changed hypothesis to fact and it essentially revolutionized the treatment of cardiovascular disease. You said that. you don't have a good memory, but you remember those numbers, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you transformed Merck from a traditional pharma approach to drug discovery to one based on mechanism of action and inhibition of specific enzymes. Can you comment on why and how you achieved this transformation and has this model caught on at other major pharma? Well, the, the uh, uh, of course, focus on enzymes or ion channels or receptors were, the, were pretty, would come naturally to any biochemist because we're used to dealing with single molecules rather than live animals. And so it was a matter, uh, getting that idea across to all the Merck people was something of, of a, uh, challenge initially because they were expert in other things, right. mostly pharmacology and chemistry. We, I thought we had the world's best chemists, uh, but they were really held back by the biology and, and therefore uh, focusing on the HMG-CoA reductase was a test for me uh, and, and a test for the whole laboratory and a demonstration that uh, that approach was was good, and that went on from that to the five alpha reductase for control of prostate size, to the new drugs for antibiotics, new drugs for hypertension. Vasotec came out of that approach. Uh, the the angiotensin receptor antagonist came out of that approach. So the Prilosec came from that. For, for hydrochloric acid control. So it was one drug after another. So once, you know, of course, people love to, to win. And once it was clear that you could win using this approach, it was, it was just magical at Merck. And Merck research at that time was a magical place mm -hmm. because, because we had such great people uh, who loved what they were doing that you know, we could almost get anything done. And, and I, I remember I was approached, I was close to the end of my time at Merck and asked whether, whether uh, I thought uh, HIV was going to be treatable. And I said, absolutely. I said, well, you know, you'll figure out the enzymes that are, that are involved in, in, in that in that virus, and, and we'll do what we've done in bacteria and what we've done in disease. Of course, it's it's controllable, and that was overly optimistic because it took longer than I anticipated. But the first protease inhibitors, all that stuff came followed. So yes, it was it was it became obvious that that was a good approach, not only to Merck but other companies got into it. And by the way, uh, I did not discover this approach. Because other people, Jimmy Black sure. focused on, on, a, on, on a specific protein, uh, the H2 receptor blockers, the beta blockers. These were all uh, conceptually the same thing. What I did was institutionalize it for drug discovery at Merck, and that's what caused it to spread sure. in the industry. 
Under your watch, at Merck, uh, under your watch, Merck developed and provided a treatment for river blindness <clears> that stands as an example of corporate morality in its highest form. Was this a difficult sell to the Merck board and your colleagues? Uh, interesting. The, the uh, discovery of ivermectin, which was shortly after I, I went to Merck, actually did not follow uh, my, my idea of, of how uh, drugs would be discovered. It was using an, an animal model right. where, where a rodent was, was uh, a model of a parasitic disease. They put three gastrointestinal parasites into the gut of, of a mouse, and then they fed uh, fermentation broths to mice. And, and this was classical approach but, but uh, to not, not amazement, because it had worked in the past, but to my surprise, uh, a broth was discovered, fermentation broth, that, that had in it a substance called avermectin, which was isolated by these great isolation chemists that we had at Merck, uh, led by George Albert Schoenberg. Uh, and and this, sub, this drug, avermectin uh, in, in toxicology studies could be improved by reduction of a single double bond which, which uh, converted avermectin to ivermectin, which at that point was the most potent drug for killing parasites by maybe a, by two orders of magnitude hmm. over earlier chemicals that would control parasites. And so this was a fabulous drug. Um, it was tested in gastrointestinal parasites for uh, uh, cattle, horses, pigs, sheep, ultimately uh, heartworm in dogs. It became a great product for animals. But it, it was not active against, uh, against uh, hookworms or tapeworms. And so it was not going to be pursued for human use until one of our clinical uh, physicians uh, Mohammed Aziz came and told me about the disease of river blindness, which is uh, caused by a parasite called Oncocerca volvulus. That parasite uh, exists as an adult and a, micro, and a uh, microfilarial form. And the microfilaria live in the skin. Uh, the disease is transmitted by the bite of a black fly. Flies bite a person who has, who has uh, these little mic microscopic worms in the skin. Within the fly, the, the parasite uh, uh, is, is, uh, becomes an adult, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, metamorphoses, and, and so that when, when the fly bites another human, it injects a form of the parasite that can become an adult. And at the site of the bite, uh, the, the uh, worms become uh, adults, males about eight inches long, females about 14 inches long. They live in lumps in the, sc in the skin, and, and they make millions of microfilaria that crawl through the skin, uh, causing uh, terrible itching. So these people are constantly itching. And they get into the eyes, causing scarring and, and blindness, the microfilaria. That's the disease. It's called river blindness because the parasites, Oncocerca volvulus, uh, uh, and, the, and, and the flies, the flies, the transmitters, live along the rivers. And so that's why it's called river blindness. People want to be near the rivers in order to have more fertile farmland. Sure. When they live there, they get bitten by the flies, they get onchocerciasis, a river blindness. So, uh, Mohammed Aziz said, should we try this drug in, in uh, the disease? I said, why not? So he went to, to uh, uh, Dakar in Senegal, western tip of Africa, saw these people who were, uh, had the lumps, were going blind. By the way, there are some, uh, at that point, there are 18 million people who were going blind, had the eye infection, over 100 million at risk, among the poorest people in the world. Uh, and and uh, so he, he went to this place. He gave he took a pinch of skin over the over the hip of these patients, 
and he counted the number of microfilaria, and there were a dozen or two dozen per pinch. So these were people who were just totally infested. Uh, he gave one tablet of, of ivermectin uh, to these patients, and then came back in a month, did another pinch, parasites were all gone. Wow. And so we got very excited about that, called the people from the World Health Organization to come and see these results, and they came and they said, you know, something's wrong. It's impossible that these were moved. So they uh, told us we had screwed up in the experiments, mm -hmm. and they left, and we turned on a huge development program because we knew we couldn't have been wrong. And, and uh, so they went back and they carried out a program where they gave patients who had the infection in their skin, in their eyes, uh, gave them one tablet, then came back at one, three, six, and nine, 12 months. And there were no parasites after a single tablet. Uh, at the end of 12 months, they started to reappear. And so it was clear that we had a drug that would eliminate this disease when given as one tablet once a year. Not going to be a blockbuster then. It was not, well, our salespeople said, of course they could sell it. And I said, to whom? You know, these people were the sure. poorest people in the world. Um, I visited people in, in Chad, which is the middle of Africa. And these people lived in, in, in uh, mud huts and wore grass skirts. I mean, these were really poor. They'd never been outside their village. Uh, and so uh, we were left with, with, with the exciting developments. The clinical research was being finished. This was uh, heading towards 1987. And, and uh, we needed to have it approved by a sophisticated regulatory agency. And we chose France. The FDA would not take it because they have no river blindness. The French took it because of French Africa sure. and French people living in Paris with river blindness. And so they took it and to my surprise, far faster than ever with a commercially important mm -hmm. drug, they called and they said, we're going to approve it in two days. At that point, we had been meeting monthly with an executive group to determine how we were going to get the drug to these people. We had no plan. We had no decision. But there, was, there had been a uh, cover story in the New York Times, the Sunday Times, with a picture of patients with river blindness, with a story that Merck had this drug. And so I could visualize, <laughs> you know, not knowing what to do with it. And so we had to make a very rapid decision. And so we decided in, in a two-day period. And we had a, uh, we had a uh, press conference in Washington where we announced that Merck would provide the drug free to anyone, anywhere in the world, for as long as it was required. Uh, that, was, that was exciting. It was, uh, it was done in a tremendous rush, so much so that I did not talk with a board. Mm -hmm. And so I made this, I committed the company <laughs> And, and uh, of course, this brought in a flood of high morale within the company and among our stockholders. So at the next board meeting, I, of course, explained what had happened. And someone said, uh, don't you think, uh, Roy, that you should have come to the board? I said, well, you know, I really didn't think of it. It was coming so fast, and we had to make the decision. Is there anyone here who would make another decision? And looked around the uh, table, there was no other really? decision. So, the, so we started in 1987, and the last uh, I heard, which was about 2009, uh, Merck was treating at that time something over 90 million patients a year free. And there are small countries in Latin America, because it's sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia, there are countries where, where the, the cycle had been broken, mm -hmm. all the, the uh, large enough regions had been covered with the drug so that flies no longer had access to the parasite and the disease was eradicated. So they can stop taking the drug. Yeah. So that was the, uh, that's yeah. the ivermectin that's story. Uh, what did you leave on the table when you retired from Merck? 
uh, well, first of all, retiring from Merck to me was like dropping off a cliff. Mm -hmm. uh, I hated it. and I, I, You were a young man at that time. I was 65. Yeah. When you become 65, and you know this when you take the job, you must retire. Right. There's no choice, and there, no one has, there have been no exceptions. Mm -hmm. and there wasn't one then at that time. And so I had no plans. Mm -hmm. I had a successor and head of research, uh, Ed Skolnick, right. who had been with me then since 81, mm -hmm. something like that. And so he was very smart, and, and I thought would be fully capable of carrying the research. Um, I had some that, that who was also going to succeed me as head of the company uh, for five years. But at the last moment, for reasons that are uh, personal, uh, he left the company. So the company was left w without, without, a, uh, without a CEO. Mm -hmm. And they went outside and hired Gil Martin, mm -hmm. who succeeded me. And, so, and I had no say in that hiring. Uh, so I left on the table a research organization, which was absolutely first rate, and leadership uh, that I thought was first rate. Uh, but, but unfortunately, the person that I had groomed mm -hmm. had left the company. And unfinished projects that you wish you could have? Uh, oh, unfinished projects <laughs> all over the place. And, and, uh, Anyone in particular? Uh, well, the, the, uh, most of them were really well on their way, and I would say, no, the, everything was happening. The uh, Fosamax was on its, you know, was done right. for osteoporosis. Uh, all our major projects were coming along. We have lots of starting projects that were still underway and, and which were taken over. Right. So no regrets then, except that you would have stayed longer. I would have stayed, yeah. I would definitely have stayed <laughs> longer. I got one more question. Yes. How do you think your scientific career <coughs> would have been different had you remained in academia instead of moving to the pharma industry? That's interesting. Uh, my scientific career, had I remained in, in academia, I assume that I would have continued to be productive mm -hmm. and do interesting things. Uh, and of course, lipids have had an explosion sure. in, in lipid modification of various things and intermediates and activators and. So there is a great biology that grew from that field and continues to grow. And, and uh, as signaling molecules, uh, so there was, there was lots of excitement that I would have been in the middle of, I believe, oh, yeah. since I'd been in the middle of it for, for so long because I divide my career almost in halves. Uh, 10 and nine year, 19 years academic between NIH in Washington U, and then 19 years at, at uh, Merck between head of research for 10 years and then nine years as head of the company. But as head of the company, I never felt that I was dissociated from research. I was extremely close to all the projects and, and felt that I could talk with the scientists just at less frequent, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. It's been a pleasure.